Hi and welcome to another episode of the Page One Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And you've just heard an advert, of course, for Page One, the writer's notebook. It is still available to pre-order now, not pledge on Kickstarter, but you can pre-order it and you'll be uh, shipped after the Kickstarter orders in around August or September, but still worth getting your hands on. So please check out the Absolutely. details in the bio. Who's on the podcast this week, Tarek? This week we have Tim Lebin, uh, author of The Silence, which you may have seen on Netflix recently, made into a film. Uh, excellent book. Uh, really nice guy. Had a really nice chat with him. Yeah, he was a great guy. Yeah, yeah. He's done a prolific amount of work. You know, he's done The Silence. He's done a whole bunch of film adaptions. Kong, Skull Island. We chat to him about all that stuff. Alien. Alien. Yeah. And he's got a bunch of fantasy books with a co-author. Uh, which I know you really enjoyed reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we talk about that in the in the uh, podcast. Uh, yeah, he's, he's been really prolific along a sort of whole wide range of genre yeah, type yeah, novels. Absolutely. Um, I, I really enjoyed the chat we had. With yeah, him. great fun, really nice guy. So uh, we hope you enjoy it too, and we'll be back at the end of the podcast. See you later. First of all, awesome library behind you. There. Yeah. <laughs> I've not read many of them. <laughs> um, What's the point of having thousands of books you've read, eh? No, exactly, exactly. As long as it looks impressive on shelves. In fact, is that just a, a painting behind you or something? <laughs> it's wallpaper. Yeah. The horrible thing that I've seen recently is, I think it was in, a, in, an, in an IKEA advert where they had the books the other way around, so the pages were, were kind of facing you. And it was really? meant to blend in properly, and it just looks absolutely horrible. That's How you'd ever find a book? <laughs> yeah, I know, but I suppose it's pot luck, though, when you're choosing your next book. Yeah, I suppose that's maybe true. I spent hours choosing the next book, and then if you could just pick one at random, and that's the one you've got to read. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like that with Netflix as well. I spend more time trying to decide what to watch or read next, and then I start, and I'm like, ah, oh, can I? I think that first thing was better. I <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um... Have you have you always enjoyed writing? Is that always what you wanted to be? Pretty pretty much. I mean, I've written since. Um, so I've probably I've written since I was probably nine or ten. To be honest, um, I started writing pre-teen. Uh, and then through my teens, I copied, copied, <laughs> mimic, mimic um, lots of writers I enjoyed, like James Herbert, Stephen King. Um, and even back before that, I was I was writing sort of war stories and Cold War stories. Um, and then all through my teens, I completely failed to finish any novels, but started <laughs> about a dozen. I wish I still had them. Uh, and then probably my early 20s, I really thought of it as a possible career. So I started writing short stories and sending them to um, competitions uh, and then small press magazines with names like Peeping Tom and <laughs> Dreams from the Stranger's Cafe and Grotesque and Dark, Dark Dreams. I'm sure some people listen to remember all <laughs> these, these magazines fondly. Um, and then mid-twenties, I finished my first novel and got it accepted for publication. And then um, steadily, well, yeah. So I've known since I was young, but it was probably from my mid-twenties that I sort of started to consider it as a possible career. What Did you do anything as a job before that, you know, before you actually got into writing full time. Yeah. In, yeah, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Oh, okay, that's fair enough. <laughs> it intrigues me. I was at East Bay for 20 years, so I was a cost consultant in the building in industry, which right. doesn't sound very creative, but there was lots of creative accounting going on. <laughs> um, but I'd, um, so I'm 50 this year, and I gave up work 13 or 14 years ago to write full time. Before that, I was writing part time for about four years. Um, I worked for local government, uh, um, my boss was one of my best friends, um, still is. Uh, he knew what I wanted to do. So those last few years of local government, I found it, they were very supportive. So if I'd need, um, occasionally I'd go, I'd ask him for a month off unpaid to finish a novel. And, he'd, and they did that several times, gave me unpaid leave to finish work. And they, oh, wow. they knew what I was working towards. Um, I saw him just last week, actually, my, my boss. I don't see him that much now. Ex-boss. Mm. I'm boss now. Actually, my wife. <laughs> uh, I saw him. I saw him last week, and I, remember, I said to him, "I remember one of the best days of my life is just when I looked around the corner of his office and didn't even need to say anything." He said, "Going, aren't you?" I said, "Yes." <laughs> uh, um, um, so, at that stage, what what was it that made you? You know, 
how many had you had published? What was it that made you say, this is it, I can do this now full time? Uh, money, basically. Money, it yeah. Was, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The convergence of um, I was quite good at doing spreadsheets and cash flow. You know, I was I was a QS. I did cash flow forecasting as a job. So I did some very probably quite creative cash flow forecasting to show my wife. So look, I can give up work here, <laughs> and we'll be fine. We'll make more money. Yeah, well, it's been it's been up and down, but honestly, I think generally I've made more money writing than I was making back then. Nice. On average, probably <laughs> there's been there's been good years and bad years. The last few years have been pretty good. A few years ago, a couple of bad years. Um, so I was, I mean, I, I wouldn't have taken the plunge unless I'd been quite confident. I was part-time by then anyway. And it was the year my mum passed away as well. I decided, oh, can I swear on the podcast? I don't know. Yeah, no, you can swear. Yeah. Go for it. You know, mum passed away. I thought, fuck it, you just got to try it. And she was real passionate about, she was excited about my writing and my books. And I just thought, just got to give it a go. And if yeah. if it all goes wrong, I'll get another job. Because, I mean, that is the big thing that I think every author would love to be able to do, you know, is, is to make that jump into full time. So, and, and I can totally get that's a scary step, but you go yeah. kind of down to part time from, so you kind of, kind of inched your way into the pool rather than jumping straight in as it was. It was a really good way to do it, actually, because the, the, I was living the life of a writer for two and a half days a week, and then I was putting shirt and tie on and going to work. So I was, and bringing in a, an income, half an income as well. And my wife was working, obviously, and still is. Um, it was a good way of doing it, but it, it was quite scary because I'd never been out of work. I left school. I didn't go to university. I left school, got a job at a building firm, and then straight off to local authority. So I was always working. I always had a paycheck. And the end of that first month when no paycheck came into the bank, <laughs> bit of a shock. But but um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sorry I didn't do it earlier because I think working for 20 years um, gave me a sort of a, I, go, I pay myself a salary now. I've got, I've got my business account and every month I pay myself a salary. So I don't get an advance and spend it all on a new car or a holiday. I put it into my account and that's yeah. earned. Yeah. Um, and I'm quite good at doing that. And I, I have got some friends who've been writers a lot longer than me who get their tax bill once a year and think, oh shit, how am I going to pay this? <laughs> so can you put money aside for tax? No. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of ridiculously organized money-wise most of the time. So And that, that comes from working nine to five. And that also, I think working nine to five before also gave me um, the sort of mental structure that I still cling on to a little bit now because my, my wife still works. I've still got a son living at home doing his GCSEs right now. So I've still sort of a nine to five mentality still when I work. Mm -hmm. They go to school and work. I write through the day. When they come home, I stop writing and start doing all the, you know, all the other side of writing, which is editing and emails and business stuff and Skypes and conference calls and whatever. And so, I mean, does that, I suppose that's right, it's, get, it's giving you a sort of work ethic, I suppose, working in a real job, if I can just say that. Yeah. Um, right. the, 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 then you were able to translate into the writing and stuff like that. Um, yeah. How many books had you done before that big decision? Well, quite sure. Probably, I mean, I've I've had lots of books published. I'm on novel 45 now, I think. <laughs> Incredible lot, number. Yeah, I know. It's Yeah, I mean, a lot of those eight or nine are in collaboration. Seven or eight are tie-in books. So there's a, there's three movie novelizations and quite a few tie-in, original tie-in novels like Alien and Predator stuff. Mm -hmm. And Star Wars. But I think when I, I probably, I probably had 18 novels published by the time I quit, 18 to 20. So in the last... 13 years since I quit, I probably had about 20 to 25 published, I guess, to a year. And that's not a, you know, it is it is a lot, but it's not a ridiculous average. And it's, I always say I, I write to a year because I spent years having to because of the money and I, I want to keep doing what I'm doing for a living. So I'm a, I'm a working writer, you know. Yeah. I'm, not, um, I'm not Thomas Harris who's got his new <laughs> in 13 years coming out, you know. I'm not sure yeah. I could, to be honest, I'm not sure. I thought about, you know, if I ever got one of those incredible mega deals that come, a, come around occasionally, could I spend three years writing a novel? No, I honestly, I'd get bored, I think. I'd write it in four months and spend two and a half years traveling, probably. <laughs> that sounds pretty good, actually, I have to say. Yeah, it does, actually, think, <laughs> with, like, a big advance. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, people find, you find your own rhythm and your own way of working as well. So I'm I, I'm a two and a half novel a year person, and usually one of those is in collaboration with Chris Golden, who I do a lot of books with. 
and I'm doing screenplays and TV ideas and all sorts of different things now as well. I mean, just touching on some of what you've said there, the, this, the, novelis- the sort of novelizations of films and working in the existing franchise type stuff, um, how did that come about? How did you get your foot in the door to do that sort of work? Uh, I think the first tie-in, first tie-in story I did was a Hellboy story for Chris Golden, actually. It was, and it was how we met. Okay, he, okay. We were aware of each other. He emailed me and said, I'm doing a Hellboy anthology. I want you to write a story. And I, I didn't know Hellboy at all. I said, no, I can't do it. He said, no, you're going to do it. And he sort of bullied me into doing it. <laughs> really glad because I had good fun doing it. Um, he told me it was one of his favorite in the book. And he said he wanted me to write. He was editing a Hellboy novel line for, I think it was Simon & Schuster at the time. And he asked me to write a novel. So I pitched him a novel and he really liked it. And it was, it was okay. And then from that, he and I started collaborating. But also from that, um, once you've done like one or two tie-in books and you deliver them on time and they're okay, editors tend to go back to you and, and you get a bit of a like reputation for just being able to play in other people's sandboxes. And I've, I've never done it for a project I'm not really excited about. Like my one of my um, labor loves was the, uh, Alien Alien novel. I'd always wanted to write Alien. And I, now I've done four and I've probably I've done with it now. <laughs> Alien. I see the poster behind you. I mean, yeah, it's really... I'm, quite, I was, I'm quite a fan of Alien stuff. And the one that I'm of yours that I've, I thought was fantastic was the Out of the Shadows, which was oh, which I listened yeah. to through the kind of radio drama that Audible did. Yeah, Max did the adaptation. That was, with... it was, I thought right. it was absolutely incredible. It was kind of first of its kind that I'd listened to, really. And just the way, just the voice acting and the, the number of actors and the sound effects and the music and stuff, it, it, was, it was great. And how did that come about? Did they... So had you written the book first, obviously, and then Audible yeah. said, we want to make some books into like a radio drama? To be honest, uh, the radio drama was nothing to do with me. Ty, uh, I'd written the book for, um, for Titan. Uh, it was part of a sort of a loose trilogy Chris Golden wrote in another and James Moore. Um, I'd written the book for Titan. When you write a tie-in project, you deliver it to your publisher, and then you don't have any rights over it. It's right. copyright. It's Century Fox. Uh, I think... Okay. I th- I think that book's been translated into like a dozen languages, and I've I I haven't even had copies of the books. So I could probably make a first <laughs> get them to be honest. The first I knew about the adaptation was Doug Maggs, the the writer and director, emailed me. He said, I loved your book. I'm really enjoying working on this, and I was well, okay. <laughs> so it's really nice from I still get emails now from people saying, "Oh, I loved that adaptation. It was wonderful." I say, "Yeah, thanks." Paul <laughs> Dirks. Dirk Max is great. He's worked with Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. And, uh, he's doing Alien 3. Yes, from the original I saw program. that. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. very excited for that one, I have to say. Yeah, I mean, definitely, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've not met Dirk, but we, we've communicated quite a bit, and he's he's a great guy. So um, that's how that came about. Oh, not cool. with me, other than writing. <laughs> but other than, exactly. And, and when you're doing a tie-in, does that, how much is prescribed to you? You know, do they say, right, we want the story to be about this and then le- leave it with you? Or, you know, sometimes I imagine that are they like, is the Star Wars one, you know, having to fit into the bigger universe? Have they said, write a story about this specific topic? Yeah, it's different for different properties. Mm-hmm. So the eight one, uh, Fox came to Titan with a really two page outline for three novels, how they tie together. I was lucky enough to get the first one, which is the Ripley novel, which I really wanted. And it, it presented me with the terrible dilemma of writing another Ripley story between Alien and Aliens because yeah. obviously she didn't remember it when she woke up. That was the only awkward bit, but I, I had great fun writing Ripley because I'm a big fan. Mm-hmm. Um, the Star Wars thing was when they asked me if I wanted to write a Star Wars novel, I said yes instantly um, because I'm, I like Star Wars as well. And the money's <laughs> so, um, and then I thought, oh shit, there's like 150 Star Wars novels. If they put me right in the middle, I'm going to have to read a load of them. And, and I did because <laughs> I was the earliest, earliest novel in the timeline, which was based around a, a comic series at the time called Dawn of the Jedi. So I, I had to write a novel in that solar system because it was just one solar system at the time. Um, and do they it, give you like a story? Do they say it has to have these characters or do you, do you have free reign to, to, to write whatever you want? I sort of had free reign. They sent me all the comics and I spoke with, uh, I spoke with the comic writers about it and I, I read all the comics and, and the outlines for future comics, and I picked three or four topics I thought were really interesting. And I was told, no, you can't go there. No, you can't. 
you know, you can't go to that planet maybe because it's going to be blown up or something. Yeah. And so, yeah. so in the end, I just I came up with totally my own story, even my own moons and space stations, and I and my own characters. And I I think um, from memory, a few of the characters from the comics sort of performed little cameos in my novel, but it, it was all my own characters. I really I really like the character Lenori Brock. She was a um, female Jedi trainee or warrior. I can't remember how they termed it, how I termed it a while ago now. Um, I was hoping to do a trilogy, but I'm now part of Star Wars Legends. Um, oh, okay. since Disney it, all, a whole tranche of those books have been consigned to Legends. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not canon anymore. So I'm, you know, the only way I'll get to write another Star Wars novel is if they ask me to do one in the, in the current whatever they're doing yeah. at the current time, or the three new movies that have just been announced. Yeah, so yeah. Right. that must be the new Ryan Johnson films, I take it? Is yeah, that a trilogy? Yeah. Trilogy. Trilogy, yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. They haven't, I don't think they've actually said that yet. But no, no, that's right. Like, yeah. The last thing on these types of novels, I suppose, is when you're doing the, uh, the ones that are actually the, because uh, I think you did Kong Skull Island and things like yeah. that, are you sent the script and then... Yeah you have to kind of just expand it and turn it into a novel effectively. Is yeah. That the, yeah. That's, that's, that's basically it. It's, it's never quite as easy as that because, uh -huh. uh, so that I've done, so Cabin in the Woods was the probably the most straightforward. I think, no, I think the first one I did was 30 Days of Night. So I was sent the script for that. Uh, I was told you can expand it, but not contract. Um, so I did put some different scenes in. I thought some dialogue wasn't great, so I changed the dialogue. <laughs> I expanded it, and then my editor loved it. And then two days later, he emailed me, said, "Oh my god, you changed the dialogue! It'll have to all go back in because you can't." So the general rule is you can usually you can expand but not take stuff out. Right. Okay. So Kong, for instance, I wrote I I did the novelization of that, and I just go but scene by scene really and turn and get into the characters' heads in each scene and put in different scenes here and there Yeah, uh, and internalise a lot. And then uh, when I finished it, it wasn't quite long enough, so I, I went back and put a couple of new monster attacks in. <laughs> it's all <laughs> to work okay. But um, I like doing novelizations because it's it's just something different. It stretches a different writer muscle. Yeah. Uh, and, it's, and it gets your name seen by people who wouldn't have seen your name before. Yeah. I mean, lots yeah. of people. Yeah novelizations would never have heard of me and probably still don't because the, the print on the book is tiny <laughs> <Or it's 11. laughs> and, and it's uh, like I said earlier I'm a working writer and it's a payday but again I've not done anything I wouldn't have wanted to do you know I liked Kong and 30 Days of Night Cabin in the Woods I in, in, enjoyed the movies and Hellboy Star Wars Alien Predator um, and I've got a Firefly novel coming out soon cool. oh cool and is, is it, do you find it um, easier to write that because you're given a kind of structure beforehand or I suppose it, it might might depend on your own ideas? But Yeah, yeah, it is It is easier. It's quicker because you've, the story's plotted out for you. So I go scene by scene. Um, if I'm lucky enough to be sent the script in an um, electronic copy, I cut and paste it into a Word file and then go through scene by scene. Yeah. Um, sometimes you send a script which is heavily watermarked, you know, the security is ridiculous. Yeah. I mail some editors, have you got it under lock and key? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> On my desk somewhere. Um, uh, so yeah, it is, it is easier because, uh, you know, I'll do, I'll do a novelization in a month or three weeks, depending on, and, and that's often dictated by the publisher as well, because they'll say, um, you know, they'll sign you up to do something and then they'll send you the script and say, oh, you've got four weeks. Mm -hmm. And then oh, you deliver. Is, is that tight timeline sometimes? It sometimes is, yeah, four wow. to six weeks. Yeah, yeah. And then you deliver and uh, you, you sit back with a sigh of relief and then they send you the shooting script. Oh, right. <laughs> Everything's so, changed. Yeah, that, that happened with Kong, actually. The the whole... No, it happened with 30 Days of Night as well. The sort of dynamic between the two main characters changed, the relationship. And with Kong, I can't remember what... Uh, there was there was some quite significant changes with Kong as well. Um, but I... I kicked off and got a bit more money for that, but generally you don't. You uh, you know you be <laughs> signing up for, and the more the more of these things you do, the more you know. They're never quite as easy as you'd like them to be, but they're also lots of fun. And it gets. Um, I still get emails about thirty days a night that I wrote ten years ago. You know, mm -hmm. the movie novelization, yeah. and it's, it's it's nice. It's just 
keeps your name ticking over out there. Right. When you're not, you know, you're not a big lights so are not a big bestseller by any means. So it's nice just to get a bit of um, visibility. Yeah, and it must be nice as well, is it? That, you know, if you're writing your own stuff, it kind of, it get, as you say, you're a working writer, so you don't want to stop writing yeah. for a period. So this lets you do that while having yeah. it all sort of plotted out for you, as you say. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it can be sort of a refresher between novels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I never, I never really stop writing. I've always, like at the moment, I'm planning a novel, I'm writing a novel with Chris Golden, I'm developing a TV series idea, and it's a couple of short stories I'm late on as well. So there, there's always, I always have different things ticking over. I'm often, round about now, I'm, I'm wishing I just had one idea to work on because, um, but then I get, if, if that happened, I get bored and start doing other stuff anyway. Yeah. It's just the way my brain works. And on the on the uh, collaboration with Chris Golden, um, I'm I'm currently reading Blood of the Four, which really well, I wrote bits. You wrote the good bits, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I'm really enjoying it actually. And oh, thanks. Thank you. Um, I'll ask you a bit more about it in a minute, but just generally working with another writer, mm. how how do you how do you do that? How do you, do you plan it out together? Do you write a chapter? You know how what's what's your approach to that? Um, we, so first of all, our styles are quite different. I think me and Chris, um, and I think that works better than if we had very similar styles because, because we're quite different. We, I always, so we write a chapter a piece. He edits mine. I edit his, I Lebanize his goldenisms and he golden <laughs> and we come up with a, like a third voice, like a different voice that we wouldn't, that neither of us would have written. Um, both voice and story, neither of us would have written those stories on our own, I don't think either. Um, so we usually plan, I think I think Chris probably plans in a bit more detail than me initially anyway. If I'm writing a novel, I'll often start with like a five page proposal to sell it to a publisher, and which, which I then throw away and write the novel. But um, I think Chris probably plans a bit more than that. But when we're writing together, we plan in more detail because it just sort of feels, um, it, it feels, essential really saying that that we do plan in detail then I, and then inevitably one of us writes a chapter and it's totally different to what we planned and it takes us off on a tangent but that's just part of the joy yeah, of yeah. And you, and so how, how long does that sort of process take if you're doing cha- are you writing at the same time or do you say right Chris you're writing a chapter this week and I'll write it next week kind of a thing yeah we do that we we very rarely I think once or twice we might have taken a chapter and written it on the same week you know i'll do one and he'll do the next one without we we do it um what's the word in in time in timeline so so i'll write a chapter we'll read it talk about it and edit it heavily and then he'll go off and write the next chapter so that we both know what's happened you know in the previous chapter um it, it's, it's become quite fluid actually chris and i are really good friends you know my american brother i call him uh <laughs> more more like an uncle actually because he's a bit older than me uh, <laughs> Listens to this, <laughs> uh, it, but it's become really, really a really great process, and we love working on stuff with each other. And it's also because we're both very busy. He's doing a TV adaptation of a series of his books at the moment, and I've got other stuff on. But collaborating, you tend after after seven or eight months, another novel pops up, and you've oh we've written another novel. And, yeah. Um, we usually. Uh, and we don't usually sell them before we've written them, actually. That's that's a bit different because uh, our solo stuff, t- generally, we're writing to contract. Um, but the, t- the the collaborations, generally, we've written and then sold them afterwards. Okay. And what happens uh, when you've you've written a chapter and Chris does a chapter and you think, oh, no, that's Chris, you've ruined where I was going with this. This is horrible. Like, do you, if, or so if you don't agree on something, what happens then? Oh, we tell each other. I mean, that, that's the... <laughs> You have to be friends to yeah. club together. I think you. I mean, I don't think anything's ever happened where we've had a row or or one of us has said actually you need to write that chapter again. We always edit each other's work. Yeah. So Chris, yeah. so Chris will tend to expand my stuff and put more character stuff in, uh, and I'll sometimes go in and do a bit more world building in his stuff. We have different things we both like doing. I like I love world building and. Um, Broad, broader scope stuff. Chris is really good at character interaction, and he's really great at plotting. So um, it's not often we come up with problems halfway 
or two thirds of the way through a novel, yeah. which I still wear and stuff. I find plotting the hardest thing to do. And I've been I've been doing that today. I've been coming up. I've been brainstorming a new novel today, and it's just uh, I've been doing it the last few days actually, and it's just it's got me wrapped up in twisted in knots. Yeah. I've just been out my gym working out trying to undo some knots, but it's uh, not always. <laughs> And on on the world building thing, obviously the Blood of the Four, just to explain mm. to people listening, is a fantasy novel, um, unrelated to anything else. Completely new world, completely new society, you know. But you get what I, what struck me was that you, within the first chapter, you have a full vision of what that society is like, how it works, and mm. you know the the tensions in the society, the different levels of classes of people and stuff like that. And that is a very, you know, to me, that's a very good skill to be able to do without it being expositiony. Yeah. Because that's often what happens when you world or when people try and build new worlds. There's just someone that will give you a lot of information about yeah. something. And yeah. that definitely yeah. doesn't happen in Blood of the Four. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, but how do you, you know, on that, how do you come up with things like, like the bodumen who are the sort of a uh, slave class of the world and things like that how do you come up first of all not just with the ideas but also with the names for these sort of things <laughs> in fantasy novels well the the bajuman were uh, i actually wrote uh, i wrote a series years ago called the Nerila series of fantasy novels and there were one two three four four novels and some novellas and short stories and i used i used that name in there and we stole it from there. Okay. Don't think key readers have actually made the link because there isn't there isn't really meant to be a link between the worlds. It's just a name we thought. Um, I seem to remember we used it as a placeholder name while we were doing the plan, and it just crept into the book and we left it. Um, but with the world building thing, with with Blood of the Four, we because um, it was such a different novel for both of us to write together. We we'd written contemporary fantasy, and we'd written like alternate, slightly alternate world fantasy and in, in um, we did a series called The Secret Journeys of Jack London and we retold three of his most famous novels with him as a main character and supernatural stuff going on. So this was very different. So we, we actually did a lot of planning for this book and we wrote a world building document right. where we described the world and the different groups of people and different uh, races and different uh, nationalities, whatever. Um, and I think that that can only help because it, it's like doing a massive amount of research for a book, but not putting it all in the book. Yeah. Even if, if you do a massive amount of research, but just use drips and drabs of that research in the book, it still feels as though you know everything about what you're writing about. Yeah. You don't have to put all the research in Dan Simmons. You know, um, <laughs> he's actually one of my favorite writers, but I, I think sometimes, um, you know, Dan Simmons' books are a bit heavy on on the research he's done or have done for him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sometimes you know, some writers are very very keen to show you all the time they spend. They've spent yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I must say he's one of my favourite writers, but that, that is, you know, yeah. that's that's minor criticism. If you read The Terror, that's the, the research helps yeah. so yeah. much. In, yeah, that's, that's actually next on my list to read is, is The Terror. Brilliant. It's, I've never felt so cold reading a book. It's oh, amazing. Oh, excellent. Like I read, yeah. was it Summer of Night? Which, Oh, it's terrific as well. Fantastic, okay. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent book. And uh, what we about world building? Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> by planning massively, you you've got all that weight of knowledge behind you, and you can just pick and choose which bits you need to use to sort of create a sort of a three D image of the world with with you know soul and and heft instead of uh, like you say info dumping loads of stuff which people skim over. Or forget because yeah. it's just yeah. interesting. Really. And did you have so you you've got you're building the world and you're getting all this information so you know the background to it. But before you did that, did you have the idea of the central story or the characters and then build mm. the world around them, or was it let's tell a fantasy novel? Here's a world. What can happen? Yeah, we had more of a story of the characters. The, to be honest, the original idea was it was going to be Atlantis, right? And it was. Um, uh, it was, I think the pitch was something like three families, two centuries, one downfall or something like that. Um, by changing it from Atlantis to a whole made up world didn't actually change anything at all other than preconceptions for the readers. Yeah. So 
it was a good thing. That was our editor actually asked us to do that, and it was a good call, I think. Um, but we we sort of had the we had the background idea that it was going to be about the fall of a society due to various pressures and magic and greed and all the great fantasy things yeah. um, that you can do in one book, which we did <laughs> instead of, instead of fifteen. Yeah. Um, so. So we, we were hoping that would be the great sort of selling point for this book, that it's standalone, and it, um, I don't want to spoil it for you, but it finishes. There's, there's no, there could be sequels, there could be other books in the same world, but the story, this story finishes. Mm. Uh, uh, it's, it strikes me as well, because it's such a rich world, you know, obviously some, some of your other stuff has been picked up and we'll, we'll touch on that, but... Um, it, you know, it, I think because of the richness of the world, it would be it would be very good for a, a sort of adaptation of some kind. Especially, it's quite in vo- on vogue the the fantasy stuff on TV and stuff. It is, yeah. I should chat to my manager. Yeah. And Chris. <laughs> yeah. I think the the thing with fantasy stuff it is it it's very expensive to make. Yeah. And I think the fantasy stuff you see being picked up tend to be very popular series. Um, Blood of the Four didn't take off, you know, it sold okay, but it wasn't like the big bestseller we were hoping to be. If it had been a massive bestseller, number one on the New York Times list, I'm sure we'd have been showing it around to people. Um, but, you know, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, people have, a few people have read them, and <laughs> Brandon Sanderson stuff's been done, and, uh, you know, lots of other fantasy yeah. series that have heard of. So, um yeah, it, it would be nice to see, but I, I think we, you know, as a writer and my manager, we sort of, we focus, we pick and choose on stuff that we think might get more interest. Yeah. Blood of the Four, maybe, maybe at some point. I mean, Chris is doing a TV series at the moment based on his um, uh, Walker, Ben Walker books, that's right. Okay. Ararat and Pandora Room. I've got a possible TV thing happening that I can't talk about yet. So <laughs> we'll, we'll turn the we'll turn the mic off to worry, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, well um, let's let's chat about something that that was turned into a film then. Obviously the silence and that might yeah. be what a lot of people know you for now especially. Um, yeah. and that's kind of it's kind of the opposite as opposed to kind of building a world, you're deconstructing a world and Yeah, um, I've done a, that too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, which I, I thought the book was, was excellent and and I, I definitely enjoyed having it start before everything goes to shit and seeing, yeah. everything, seeing the, the kind of PM and the government and all that kind of stuff come to pieces basically and I mean, yeah. how did that how did that story come around what 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 got you into that part um, well I've, I've destroyed the world quite a few times <laughs> fiction uh, the idea for the silence um, came 2013, 2014, and I, I, I can. It's not often I remember a moment where I, where I think, oh, that's a great idea for a novel. I have to really hack and chew and throw ideas together to get a good idea for a novel. But I remember thinking, monsters that hunt by sound, and I'll call it the silence. And the whole thing came from that. Um, and I, like I say, I love destroying the world. I'm a big fan of Wyndham and John Christopher and yeah. writers like that, who, and. and yeah. British Apocalypse, uh, the uh, survivors, and um, uh, Day of the Triffids, and yeah. stuff. I'm, you know, still a big fan of that. And I also think when I started it, I thought I could set this in America, but it just wouldn't feel. It felt like a very British story to me, the the contained family thing, and the the whole thing starts in us, which is close, very close to where I live, little town where I live. Um, uh, and that's how that came about, really. And the, it came from the idea that single single idea and my one of my big fears is um family in peril because i've you know i've got family and i've written about that loads probably most of what i write about is families in peril and the lengths you go to protect your own family as well yeah. which is a discussion i'm sure we all have with friends you know would you kill to protect your own family? fuck yes I <laughs> family. absolutely no doubt about it um and yeah okay so it came from there yeah Written in 2015. Uh, <laughs> well, yes. Long so, before any other films of its ilk. I can't imagine what film you might be talking about. So. No. <laughs> well, 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 how did the Netflix thing, how, you know, how did it, was, was The Silence a big, massive success? Did it catch someone's eye on Netflix? What, what, how did that happen? Um, I'm not entirely sure how it... Uh, so so it, was, it was in production the same time as the other film. The other film crept out before us. Yeah. Um... um you know, same ideas circulate. 
they're back they're actually they're very two very different films the core concept is the same but i think they're very very different in they execution. are very different yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah so it's been a bit frustrating to see every single review starting yeah. with oh this is a rip off of a quiet place no it isn't just for uh, this interview i was sort of trying to read a bit of the reviews and stuff and the, you know, very few reviewers seem to do a bit of research. Yeah. They wouldn't take very much research it's just to lazy actually find journalism. It. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of lazy journalism. There, there's also, I mean, on the plus side for me as the writer of the novel, there's lots of talk of the novel in these, sometimes in the reviews, but always in the place beneath the reviews that you should <laughs> never read, which is <laughs> never read the comment section. Yeah. But obviously, I'm. I, I'm attached to it, so um, I, I've been reading the comment section on YouTube and The Guardian. Oh my god, <laughs> that sort of thing will drive you mad. Though <laughs> <laughs> I, I've stepped away now, but I, I mean, I, I didn't get, in, I, I, from the very beginning, I decided I can't get involved in all, all the these these message sections, mess, you know, comments, whatever, because first of all, it would look crass the writer stepping in and arguing with people, and secondly, there's too much of it. But it was, it was really nice to see lots of people have stepped up and said, actually, this is, um, you know, Tim's novel was released mm. in 2015. The same thing with Bird Box. They got the same criticism. And Josh released his novel in 20, I think, same year as The Silence or maybe even the year before. Um, but, yeah, two very different films. And uh, um, what was the question? How did he get to Netflix? Well, I think after um, it, uh, it was going to be out with Global Road, who uh, then went bust. And then uh, Netflix picked it up, basically. So I think it's been a great result, and it's been um, Netflix seemed very happy with it. So and, and is there any involvement from your end? You know, once Netflix have it, do you get to have a say in what happens next? Like in in terms of the adaption of it, the writing of the script, or the it was the, the film, changes and stuff. The film was finished before Netflix picked it up. It was um, it's actually a Netflix original, but it wasn't made by Netflix. It was right. made by Constantin right. in Germany. Film. German film company, uh, so it was it was a done it was a finished product, and then Netflix bought it. Right, back, okay. That's the filmmaking process. I didn't. Um, I was sort of involved. So I I've be, become friends with the whole team. It's it's the sort of filmmaking um, process that you never hear about, yeah. and you don't believe it exists because you hear so many horror stories. Um, and I'll tell you about one in a minute. But it's <laughs> yeah. I'm the director he and i firm friends now and the writers are great the producers are fantastic the constantine guy rob colzer is great and i it's it's just been a great experience from beginning to end um they included me just to sort of run ideas past sometimes i was very aware Kerry and shane van dyke were the writers but just occasionally if they were having like um a difficult bit with part of the script they run it by me and ask me for ideas and the director called me a few times just to talk about a few things so i was never i was never creatively involved really i, I was involved putting in you know just uh putting in a, the occasional opinion yeah <laughs> and, and i mean that is unusual because we've spoken to other writers whose stuff has been adapted for film or tv and they yeah. are very much of the sort of thing where you just have to kind of hand it over and then Hope it, hope it goes well, and if it doesn't, yeah. you, you 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 pretend it's not your book. <laughs> um, um, there, though, that's the thing. You know, I, I was I was prepared. I was prepared for that. I had confidence in the whole team from the beginning. Um, but your book's always there as an object, as a creative thing. If film's totally different and totally awful, you can still refer people to your book. Mm -hmm. uh, and would you have any say over who? Over the team, like if would you get to meet them, and, and if you didn't like them, say no, I don't want to give you the rights to my book. On oh, well, no, I mean, if I hadn't gone with the producer, I might have said no, but, yeah. I, but I did, so I said yes. And from once you once they have your rights, they assemble their own team. Yeah. So I, it wasn't sort of run past me. Oh, we're using this director, we're using these writers because that's not my business. That's the producer's business. Um, I wasn't I wasn't that involved. I'm sure that happens when you're. George Martin or <laughs> Stephen King, but maybe not even then. I'm not sure honest. it does happen with Stephen King. Stephen King, some, happen, of his... some of his stuff he's not happy with. Isn't no, he? no, definitely. That's right. I'm not sure it does. It, it's a very, it's a different world. The filmmaking world's very different. Um, I've been, I've been very lucky to have such a great experience. My previous experience wasn't so great. It was um, Pay the Ghost a few years ago with Nicolas Cage in it. Um, 
still, you know, the film happened and it was great. It came out, and I'm, I'm, I'm. It's, it's, it's a reasonable horror film. I think I don't think it's terrible. Um, but that wasn't a, that wasn't an experience where I was kept informed or had any part of it really. I didn't speak to the producers. There was one producer, the original guy who optioned it, was really decent. But that that was one of those experiences that you mentioned there, where they take your story and they go and they they make the film, and it's it's whatever it is. Um, the silence team. I mean, they. I went out to Toronto on set, and I was in the movie. I was a corpse. Oh, brilliant! Uh, yeah, it's just a dream scenario. <laughs> and even you know, the I was I went to Netflix a few weeks ago with my wife to watch it. They did a screening there. Um, it's just been great from beginning to end, actually. Okay. It's not open, hopefully. So, no, that's yeah. right. On that note, are you? Do you write? Uh, are you wanting to write more sort of screenplays and things like that, or would you want to stay in the novel world mainly? I'll always write novels, but I'd like to do some TV um, because TV is just fantastic at the moment. It's exploding. There's so yeah. many outlets for it, and so much content is required. So. I am working on a TV, an original TV, mm-hmm. uh, which isn't connected to any of my books. But that's very, very early days. And I'm not, I've, I've written scripts. I've never had anything produced, but I've got a couple under development. And just just from a sort of technical side of things, you've, you've obviously, I presume, got an agent for your novels and things like that. But would the same agent deal with any inquiries or, or stuff for your TV stuff? Or do you need to get a different agent or a manager or something for that? especially if well, it's in America. Yeah, yeah. Well, my main agent is in America anyway. He's in Howard Morheim. He's my he's my main agent for everything. So he he has a sub-agent in LA who's my manager. He's got a sub-agent in the UK who's my UK agent. So, so Howard's my main guy. Anyone who wants to look at any of my work for TV or anything like that goes to Howard and asks him. And then he'll direct them to Michael, my manager in LA, or... He's got a translation writer agent, and he's you know links all over the place. So really, I've got four or five agents, but really, it's Howard. He's he's my main guy. And and how did you first find him then? Um, I was with another agency in the UK, which I decided I wanted to leave. So I put some feelers out and just got some recommendations from friends. I, and I again, I was very lucky because I ended up with Howard, and I can honestly couldn't imagine anyone better. Um, and I was. Just before I went full time, that's probably fourteen years ago now. Oh. Wow. Um, did, did, yeah. you, did you have that experience that you know a lot of a lot of writers when they're starting out have, which is you're sending out <clears throat> um, submission letters or query letters to agents and not getting anywhere, or did you get picked up quite quickly? Um, I got picked up fairly quickly. Uh, that's thanks to uh, Simon Clark, who is a British horror writer I was friendly with at the time. I think he recommended the agent I went to, although he wasn't with him. I can't quite remember how that. It was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Can't, my memory's terrible. Um, yeah, I did. I think I sent a few letters out, but I was picked up fairly quickly, um, and I stayed with that agent for a few years, and then sort of decided it was time to move on to uh, someone with sort of wider reach. I think really. So I, um, I was very lucky enough to get picked up by Howard. And I, I, you know, I got loads of writer friends. And some of them occasionally will moan about their age and say, oh, I'm thinking of moving on. And I, it's never crossed my mind. It's one of those, you know, great relationships. We've become good friends and we're a great team. So, again, I'm very lucky in that regard to have to have some supportive person, you know, looking out for me and looking after my work. And your, your writing is, I think you might be known, I suppose, for horror quite a lot, but you're not just a horror writer. You've obviously fantasy, young adult stuff. Mm. Um, sci-fi a bit as well you know I, you seem to have quite a wide array of worlds of stories that you want to tell you're not sort yeah. of pigeonholed into one category well sometimes they just the story just comes out that way like i've written a couple of thrillers as well one called the hunt one called family man which is a sort of indirect sequel um and they uh the hunt just came about because i'm into insurance sport like marathons and iron mounts and stuff like that um and I just thought I should write about it because I'd spent so much time training. I thought I should be writing about this. So I came up with The Hunt, which was a, it's a chase thriller. Um, and it, it's just, it's, I could have made it supernatural, but it just didn't seem to suit the idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
similarly the fantasy the fantasy novels I wrote at Dusk and Dawn but they're to be honest they're horror novels in a fantasy world they're really 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 dark fantasy mm. uh, so yeah I mean I'd, I'd never I'd never say that I'd never do something naval historical romance probably not <laughs> <laughs> but who knows, who knows it just sometimes and it's also when you write all the time I couldn't just write the same type of horror novel every year because I it, it would bore me and it was all I think it would also um it would show through as well if I was getting bored with what I was yeah. writing readers would get bored with it yeah, as well yeah what what do you what sort of stuff do you enjoy, do you enjoy reading across these sorts of areas as well or do you read you know anything really yeah I read um, yeah again no no historical naval romance yeah. but if, <laughs> you know or a sci-fi fantasy thrillers more non-fiction than I used to um not read you know it's I wish I could read more. I always wish every, at the end of every year I keep a note of all the books I'm reading. Mm-hmm. Read twenty a year or twenty five a year. It's not that much. Probably not even twenty five a year to be honest. I used to read a couple of books a week. That was before I was writing full time and before I had kids. Um, my friend Mark Morris, another British horror writer, he's on novel thirty two this year, I think. But he's oh, reading. Really? How the hell do you? Die? <laughs> But then, like Mark says, he uh, you know he he'd rather sit and read than go out for a bike ride. I I go out for long bike rides and runs, and you know you choose you pick and choose what you do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And 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 what is your kind of writing style when you do sit down to write? Do you kind of revise as you go, or do you do you like to do do a first draft and um, um, let it sit to draw? So that's that's sort of changing a bit as well. I've just started. Oh, you, this probably interests you with your you know. Why we're being, why we're chatting. So I've just started writing longhand. This is a novel, ah. Co- Code and Quill from the States. It took me a long time to find this. It's a really beautiful, really beautiful notebook. Mm-hmm. Um, lovely, yeah. It suits, and I had to import it, and but I got a couple of them. But that that suits sort of uh, writing with a fountain pen. So my handwriting is terrible, terrible. But uh, I've started writing longhand, a novel that's on hold. But the next novel I start very soon will be longhand. And totally unusual for me. Um, haven't done it for a long time. Um, so why is changed, that? Why have you changed to the longhand because, form? Because so I haven't done it for a long time. I wrote a novella called Rhyme three or four years ago, longhand in notebooks in cafes, and it was such a great experience. Because so my typing's not great. I'm like a four finger typist, <laughs> and so I'm obs- I'm always going back correcting correcting words and sentences and paragraphs. But writing longhand, I just it just flowed straight away, so I wasn't worried about editing or going back, and it just seemed to be. I wrote quicker for a start because it was just it was almost stream of consciousness partly, um, and also I quite like the disconnect from technology, so I can go and sit in a cafe with a notebook and a pen. Yeah. Uh, I've still got to train myself to leave the phone at home, but I am intending to do that. Just. <laughs> Go old school. Just go out and be out of contact for three hours. You know, my wife knows cafe, cafe I'm in or whatever. Um, but you, but usually that's unusual. Usually, um, I'll plan roughly and then start a novel and then plan two or three chapters ahead as I'm writing. So as I'm typing a typing um, typing my words in and I get an idea, I'll have a, a bit at the end of the novel I'm working on, the end of the file with loads of brainstormed ideas so I don't some people plan chapter by chapter and I I you know before they start and to me that's telling the story before you start yeah yeah I have an idea of where I'm going and I've usually got a rough idea of the ending but usually when I'm getting towards the end of a novel I write much quicker because I want to know what happens at the end mm-hmm. it's almost like you know oh my god I really can't wait to finish <laughs> Someone know if he lives or dies yeah and I suppose that is very different you know if you that's almost more like your work you do in the alien universe or, or the, sorry the the film adaptions if you're doing Kong or whatever that seems more like a chapter by chapter breakdown you know exactly where it's going and it isn't the yeah. same when you're writing your own book I imagine no it's not at all no no I'm I'm very very fluid and sometimes a bit too much like Chris Chris Golden would say you know I go off track I have done it in a couple of novels where I've totally gone off off piece from the plan <laughs> what the fuck are you doing is it actually that <laughs> That might work, but but think, in a way that that keeps it, you know, that as you said, it kind of keeps it fresh and it keeps it exciting for you as as someone that's yeah. writing it. And I think the base novels that comes across in that that you know you you can tell that the the author or you 
maybe not consciously, but you know, you're excited as the reader to yeah. find out, and that's probably because the the writer is is exactly yeah. the same. Whereas yeah, I think yeah. if you planned it out chapter by chapter, or you told someone this is how it's going to end exactly, you might end up not writing it. It's a bit like George. Like, are there going to be other Game of Thrones <laughs> novels? I'm not sure. If, if you're yeah. seeing someone else making it in front of you, why would you bother to sit yeah, down and try yeah, and write absolutely. all of that? I don't know. He's a, he's a Italian writer now, you know. Yeah. yeah. I bet he's going to get better time fees than I get, though. <laughs> you know, I do. I do plan. Um, I'll make. I'll make character notes and I'll make chapter notes and uh, even ideas about the world I'm in. Or you know, and so the the further I get into a novel, the the bigger the note file is becoming at the end of that novel. Yeah. And then at the end, I finish the novel and I've got 20 pages I have to go through to make sure I've incorporated everything. Mm -hmm. But also, this is why. Your idea is such a great idea, I think. So I have notes at the end of a novel. I have separate files on my computer with different notes. I have notebooks. I have scraps of paper. And I have, you know, and sometimes I'll, uh, if I'm out, I'll make a note on a receipt and put it in my pocket and lose it. Uh, I've got, I mean, a rough estimate. I've got 12 or 13 notebooks on my desk at the moment. And I know <laughs> I might have made a note about something that's quite important, but I won't necessarily remember which notebook it's in. Mm -hmm. So page one, I think, is a great idea for keeping everything together in one place well, without having it electronically. And I think that's the beauty of it. You could you could do that. You could do page one electronically and maybe, you know, it could be that you've got a version that is going to be like that. But I think having a writer's like notebooks, I love notebooks. Yeah. I buy them all the time. Yeah, yeah, same here. Having one dedicated to the fact, I think, is a great idea. Oh, cheers. Well, yeah, we hope we hope you like it when you get, when you get it. Yeah. <laughs> And you are getting it. That's the good news. We have. Yeah, we have, we have, have hit a target. Yeah. Congratulations, by the way. That yeah, was no, great. Thanks. Yeah. thanks. And quick as well. Yeah, it was. It was quite early in the in the campaign. Yeah, yeah. No, we did much better than yeah, we thought. I, I, I was especially because there's a middle slump bit where you know it, it kind of yeah. the starts really really big and it's all new and then. For the next kind of week or so, you kind of think, "Oh yeah. God, is this ever actually going to go anywhere?" This, this is, is the most mistake. terrible idea. We can never tell anyone we've done this again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it worked. Out, it worked out well. But um, so, for what? What? I know you said you can't tell us about the TV thing, but what? What is next that you can tell us about? New book with Chris, um, which can't. Well, we haven't sold it yet, so I probably, I probably shouldn't say what it is. But we're really excited about it. It's a real high concept idea. Cool. Um, we're working on that at the moment and that's almost ready for our agent to see it. Um, I'm working on a novel idea that I, uh, this sounds, sounds really wanky, but I can't mention it because <laughs> it's, it's like, I'm not quite under an NDA, but it's like, you know, I can't mention it yet. But next for me, um, I got a novel out next month called The Edge, which is, um, the third of the Relics trilogy that I've been writing in the last three years. So that ends, ends that trilogy. Um, probably other stuff. A Firefly novel later in the year. Oh yeah, that, no, awesome. Original Firefly novel. Um, that was fun because I'd not watched Firefly when they asked me to do it. So, oh really? Uh, so I sat and watched the whole series and loved it. Luckily, yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> sure, it's yeah, it's, really, it's really great. Yeah, yeah. I've gone back to it since with my wife. It's terrific stuff. So yeah, a few, quite a few logs in the fire. Then <laughs> I think it's fair to say. Yeah, the TV idea and and well, an original TV idea that I'm working on developing and another possible tv thing that will be announced soonish oh very exciting yeah quite Just, a long ago then yeah 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 i mean none of these things you know tv option is great it doesn't mean it's going to be a tv series but it's obviously a big step yeah absolutely further than just having the book on the shelf and yeah. it's got a really great team behind it um yeah so i mean have, have you have you noticed uh an increase in kind of attention for that sort of thing from the silence? Has, has, has that kind of got you noticed in that world a bit more? Um, yeah, it has a little. I mean, it, it, you know, having something so visible, and for a while it was massively visible yeah. all over the place. Oh, everywhere. Just, it was everywhere, yeah. Adverts popping everywhere. up. It just, it, yeah, yeah. It can't hurt. And yeah, I, yeah. I did out to LA for a while um, with my wife to see the screening on Netflix. And had loads of meetings while I was out there with TV and film people, so that that doesn't hurt either. Just putting a face to a name, yeah. Meeting somebody over a beer or a coffee and knowing that you can get on with them and work with them, it's a. Uh, I mean, I've, I've only really sort of dipped my toe into the business, but it's it it's human nature is a great driver, I think. 
in any in business. Yeah. But all, especially if you're going to invest so much time and effort and money into somebody, you've got to know you can work with them. And just, you know, an hour over a coffee can tell you that sometimes, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So great meetings out there and, and made, you know, a lot of good contacts and friends. So it's good. Yeah. Hoping to see more in the future. Like my wife said, you know, this trip's an investment. Nothing might come of it and nothing might come of it. But, you know, I'm always living in hope that the silence isn't the last movie. So I did, um, when Pay the Ghost came out a few years ago, I did a private friends and family screening on a big screen at a local theatre uh -huh. where I live. And I thought this is my one and only. And then last Friday I did another one for the silence. <laughs> So I'm hoping, you know, hoping there'll be a third or a fourth. Oh, I'm sure there will be. Yeah. I hope so. It sounds like it. It sounds like uh, there's, there's stuff happening. So yeah. I think things I'm are sure. ticking over. Yeah. It's all, yeah, it's it's a great it's a great time to be a writer, to be honest. I mean, TV is just so massive. I probably, everyone I met um, wasn't only movie people, they were TV people. It's huge. It's huge at the moment. And Apple coming online now with their streaming service. And yeah, that's right. And Disney as well and stuff. Disney, whoever else wants to do it. They, and they all need content. They all need, and they all need really good content, you know? Yeah. Uh, and actually, amazing. a lot of it as well is, a lot of it is more now than ever, I would say, there's more demand for sort of genre type yeah. stories. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Especially on TV. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it just amazes my wife and I, like you said earlier, you, you sit sometimes, we'll watch an episode or something and then turn on Netflix and spend half an hour surfing. Yeah. Just see all these new series and we've not heard of half of them. Yeah. Where do they And they've all got they've all gone through the same process. Some of them are originals and some are books that have been picked up or, you know, writers have pitched ideas. So it's a it's a great time to be a writer, I think, really. Yeah. The next big one they've got is The Witcher. That must be quite soon. Yeah. We pretty I think at the end of the year. End of the year, is it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But Netflix throw up something new every week. And you, Whoa, yeah, it's crazy. It? It's mad. Too much stuff to watch. Oh, but not enough time to do, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, the same as my, my backdrop here. Too many books to read. But yeah, I'd rather exactly. have more shelf available to read than not know, you know, than just have... I've never been one for, oh, I've got one book on my to be red pile. I've yeah. literally probably got a thousand that I'm, I'm never going to read all the books I own, but I'd much rather. No, that's yeah. what, I mean, actually going back to the comments under this, the stories that you should never read, but you know, there was a lot, a lot of comments I was reading that was sort of like on oh, Netflix, it's full of rubbish and it's full of, you know, but it's like, you know, five years ago, you didn't have this yeah. service where it gave you so oh, much. And yeah, what a okay, there, to have to have. there might be some bad stuff on there, but there's loads of good stuff yeah. that, that, yeah. can, that can entertain you forever yeah. if For you like want it. A tenner a month. Yeah, it's exactly. crazy values. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tenner a month, and you, you could watch 12 hours a day, 30 days a week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Probably not catch up with everything you want to. Exactly. Which and is that's, great. that's why I never get my writing done. Yeah, and anyway, we have to go watch some TV. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, that's a danger. That's a danger. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, it's probably a weird thing. I never watch TV, very rarely watch TV on my own. So I never watch it during the day when I'm working. I've got friends who watch an episode or something for lunch, but I, I don't do that. I tend to, you know, get my training in or whatever during that time. And I only, really only watch TV with my wife. So luckily we have very similar tastes. That's good. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Are, you, are, are you training for something big in particular yeah so uh july 28th on 50 i'm doing ironman canada in oh Whistler. wow that'll be amazing yeah. my, my fifth ironman on my 50th birthday yeah oh man oh, is this your fifth one bloody hell good effort yeah, yeah. i'm a bit worried about it to be honest because <laughs> you know it uh, you need a lot of training goes into an ironman if you want to do it and even survive, let alone do it well. So, um, what's the distance year, again for each thing? Two point four mile lake swim, and then one hundred and twelve mile very hilly bike ride, and then a marathon at the end. <laughs> <You know. laughs> that's insane. Hours to do it. My best time is twelve hours twenty minutes, but I'm not going to hit that. That's on a flat course in um, Nottinghamshire, or, uh, <laughs> the airport. So I'm not going to hit that in Whistler. But also this year, you know, I've been in LA for that was a, almost a two week trip. I was in Germany for a week launching The Silence with the German publisher before that. So I've had a bad few weeks training. <laughs> I've, got, I've got three months, so I'm trying to commit myself now. Oh, Even today, oh. I haven't done much. I should have gone out on a bike ride 
Speaking <laughs> to instead, so, you're speaking to us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if you no, ruined like, your arm, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll blame you if I don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, best of luck with that. That's yeah, thank too. you. Yeah, yeah. Family holiday. Well, you know, we're all the uh, all my wife and two kids gonna spend two weeks in Canada, and it, it's like holiday of a lifetime for my fiftieth. So, what more can I ask for? Yeah, Great. absolutely, brilliant. No, that sounds awesome. Especially yeah. for them, I'm not sure about the yeah, be, 12, yeah. <laughs> twelve hour. I made sure the Ironman's quite at the beginning of the holiday, yes. so I get yeah. uh, I got three days to acclimatize, do the race, and then I got nine or ten days just not worrying about what I eat and drink afterwards. Yeah. Not like work a huge amount, but. You know, you can't get tanked up the night before an Iron Man. It's, it doesn't work. <laughs> no, that's a spec. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Well, uh, at the end of every podcast, we like to do sort of quick fire questions. So it's a one right. or the other type thing, but feel free to expand on any of these if you want to. Um, okay. But we'll start with um, Star Wars or Star Trek. Star Wars. Uh, TV or cinema? Ooh. Oh, that's a, a cinema. But, that, <laughs> but that's, that's a tough one. Wow, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Lord of the Rings of, or Game of Thrones? Game of Thrones. Because it's just ended. Line of Duty or Bodyguard? Haven't seen either. Oh, fair <laughs> <enough>. <laughs> <laughs> Um... Uh, Bird Box or Station Eleven? Bird Box. And uh, Real Book or Ebook? Real Book. It's surprising the number of people that say Real Book. I thought it'd be. I'm not a big Ebook think... fan, but yeah. most folk go for Real Book. I don't own an e-reader. Oh, do you not at all? No. Well, I I read off the screen all day. You know. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So that, and uh, to relax, to be honest, I read mostly in the bath. I sit in the bath. And tonight I've got a date in the bath with myself and a book <laughs> and a glass of wine. Um, yeah, reading. Yeah, I, I am very close to buying an e-reader because a um, good friend of mine, Rio Ewers, a uh, writer, he's he says he edits. He sort of reads his own stuff on an e-reader, oh, changes okay. the font, yeah. changes yeah. the font, and it feels like he's reading somebody else's book almost. Mm -hmm. You pick up a lot of errors doing that. I think that's a really good idea because I, I tend to edit on my computer screen in the same font that I've written it in, and it's I'm reading my own bloody book. For <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It's very easy just to miss things. Yeah, that, that's quite a good tip actually. Yeah. I like yeah. that idea. I've never tried yeah. that before. Yeah, yeah. So I'm close to buying one, but I I still like you see behind me. I still yes. like real. <laughs> yeah, it's still a question actually. When I saw the library, of course. You <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And the uh, last one, a uh, fancy restaurant or takeaway? Oh, fancy restaurant. Totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, Thanks. thanks very much for talking to us, Tim. Marvel or DC? Oh, Marvel. Oh, yeah, DC, sorry. Of course, yeah, no, he, he, he's <laughs> that's he knows his stuff. <laughs> Marvel, of course, obviously, Marvel. But I haven't seen Endgame yet. I've just you booked tickets yet. Saturday. No, I booked tickets for Saturday. I've avoided somehow, spoilers. Um, but my son, my son's fifteen. He's just doing his GCSEs. Nearly sixteen. His mates told him everything about it. Oh so no! He's, yeah, not happy. So I'm, I'm just creeping around the house trying to avoid him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I basically went off all forms of social media for about a month before it came out because I was, I do not want to ruin anything for myself. But it's, oh. it's excellent. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I can't. I'm looking forward to it. it yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely, definitely a, a good day. Uh, chapter in yeah a good, a good yeah. ending to it all yeah. absolutely yeah, yeah. good 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 it's quite a remarkable achievement really it's, i mean it's not yeah i'm not being a massive fan of all the films i um i like them they're good entertainments you know i'm not as emotionally involved in those films as, I, as maybe mm -hmm. i am some other like game of thrones for instance i'm i'm much more emotionally attached to that program than i am to the marvel films yeah for some reason uh because it's more gritty and grim and i'm Fairly grim, I suppose. <laughs> that that means you should like DC, surely. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. It is grim. I I wanted Zod to win in the. In the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. What What have you made of the? Have you been? Are you up to date with Game of Thrones? Yes, I'm totally up to date. Yeah, I'm loving it. Yeah, I'm loving it as well. Wait, 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 I've not watched the okay, last I'm episode. Not, I'm not going to spoil anything. Just... But um, but uh, there seems to be a lot of you know the sort of fanboy whining about. 
where the story's going and all this sort of stuff. But I've, I've enjoyed this series as well. I'm enjoying it. I think yeah. it's, uh, yeah. A friend of mine, Stephen Volk, said he, um, there's lots of people saying, well, they, they're just feeling their way through now. And mm. Steve said, and he's absolutely right, they know exactly where they're going and exactly what they're doing and how they're getting there. Mm. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, I mean, I'd have made different decisions, different choices in the last couple of episodes, but then anyone watching it would have, I'm sure. Yeah. Because there's so many potential resolutions and conflicts now that no, there's no one person that's going to be 100% pleased by what they do. No, exactly. I think it's like that with anything that's been long running for this long, you're always going to get folk who are not yeah. happy and you, you can't please everyone and you, and you should try to. No, no, absolutely. And you, and you should just be also just open-minded about it and say, you know, well, it, it's not exactly how I'd have done it, but it's great. Yeah. yeah. It's a, that's another momentous achievement. I think Game of Thrones has oh, been totally. fantastic from beginning to end. It might have usurped my favorite TV series of all time is The Shield, which isn't, you know, it's a cop thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but The I, Shield is excellent, yeah. Yeah, but I think that was one of the first almost novelized TV series. Yeah, it was, you know, probably. It wasn't feature of the week, it wasn't story of the week, was it? And it, mm-hmm. uh, it's Shakespearean in its scope. Um, and I, I think that The Shield and The Wire probably changed TV forever, I think. Yeah, um, yeah I think so. But I think Game of Thrones is getting up there for me. And Deadwood as well. Oh, no, and, and the movie's out soon. Yeah, so yeah, next month or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. I'm so very excited. excited. So excited about that. So Tim's quite clearly a big fan of the podcast there. He Absolutely, was, he yeah. He's very definitely. angry you didn't ask him about Marvel or DC, clearly. <laughs> Completely forgot that question. I'm not sure he gave the right answer. No one does, in fact. No, no, no. I think you find that most people give the correct answer. I mean, has anyone said DC? No one that's seen the recent films has. No, but it's not just about films. also about the, <laughs> the characters in the comics. No, it's true, though. DC does seem to get a short shift. Uh, but I suppose, yeah, based on the, the more recent films, it's probably fair. Um, no, but I really enjoyed that chat with Tim. Um, it was really good listening to what he was saying about working with Chris Golden. And yeah. I, you know, just hearing how that actually works with two people writing it and sort of taking a chapter about a week. Yeah. I, I can see that that would give you some sort of impetus each week to do it. And then it'd be quite refreshing to, to get a new take coming in. But if it, if it took you off the track you thought it was going down that yeah. might be quite annoying I can imagine said, setting yeah. a chapter off thinking yeah. nailed it and yeah. then you get your notes back and it's gone somewhere you didn't expect, expect at all and, and I think there is different writing a novel with someone than writing a script when you're when you're that in depth in someone's head it's, it is quite a personal thing and doing that is difficult with, yeah with I mean I would have thought it, there was a lot more planning than Tim seemed to suggest yeah. there yeah. that you need to have it a lot more pinned down but clearly not but and it was interesting that you know one of them's more Tim's more about the world building and Chris is more about yeah, the characters yeah. and stuff like that. But it, it, well, certainly I've read or I'm reading the Blood of the Four as I said, and I'm really enjoying it. So they've really nailed it. So yeah. it does, it, you know it can work. And I, I think it's a similar approach to the authors who write the Expanse. I can't remember the names. Top. Uh, James S. A. Corey is the name they use. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I think one person does the whole world building. One person does the tight plotting yeah. stuff and that does seem to be quite a, a, a successful method yeah no it's an interesting interesting thing and I suppose it helps with things like I don't know writer's block and stuff if you've got someone else to yeah you've always got someone to bounce ideas off or etc yeah absolutely. and very exciting getting one of his books on Netflix and oh, it sounds like he's absolutely. got other stuff in the, in the pipeline as well it sounds like he's on the cusp of really hitting the big time yeah well he is on Netflix is, he's I mean, arguably I, already yeah, the big that's time. a good point yeah. I mean that must be what many writers dreams is getting your work made into a Netflix or yeah. movie of some kind no no it, it, it's clearly I think for someone in that field the, the sort of genre horror sci-fi mm-hmm. it's a good time to be writing that oh, sort absolutely. of stuff and, and if you are a fan of that stuff I really can't recommend enough the alien adaptation of uh out of the shadows uh, which is the dirt mags kind of audio drama on audible and it is fantastic mm-hmm. the, you know production values are through the roof great voice actors and if you're a fan of alien at all definitely worth a listen yeah well ho- i hope you enjoyed that chat with tim and next week we've got a very special guest yeah, absolutely yeah no very excited to say that we've got peter james uh, the world famous crime author yeah very yeah, excited. On the podcast, we're really excited to speak to Peter. Um, so 
please do tune in for that one. And as always, of course, you can get in touch with us by sending a tweet to at right underscore gear, or you can fire us an email with any questions you might have for Mr. James to podcast at rightgear.co.uk. Yep, and uh, as always, thanks to Simon Stokes for his production assistant. And we'll just leave you, as usual, with a few more words about page one, the writer's notebook. It is still available, as we say, to pre-order. Just check the link in the bio. Hope you like what you see and uh, hope you order it. And and please go online and rate us. And oh, yes, send us we're a reminded. Yeah, more ratings helps us go up the charts, which helps us attract bigger authors and keep going with this. So please, please do rate us. And Absolutely. as well as rating, actually, leaving reviews makes a huge difference, yeah, even yeah. if it's just a one-line review. Please do that. Um, and otherwise, we'll see you next week. See you later. 